silver investing guru David Morgan, a regular on SGT Report, X-22 Spotlight, and Greg Hunter, and has been featured on many of Mike Maloney's special GoldSilver.com videos. In today's interview, he blows the lead on what's coming for the U.S. economy once China officially shuts down the dollar window and takes its allies with it. You want to make sure that you download our exclusive report on David Morgan's decades-long accurate analysis. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Morgan. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Precious Metals New Bull Run series of shows. My name is Michelle Holliday. To kick off the new year, we have a news update. PortfolioWealthGlobal.com just announced to our subscribers our number one gold opportunity on January 2nd and our pick catapulted higher on the back of a sharp rebound, rallying by 65% in just three trading days, January 2nd through January 4th. So these are amazing times to stay ahead of the game and stay informed on precious metals. Today, we are thrilled to be interviewing Mr. David Morgan, who is a well-known silver guru. David is the publisher of The Morgan Report. He has been interviewed by CNBC, Fox News, and the Wall Street Journal. He's considered to be one of the top authorities in the arena of silver investing. David, welcome to the show. How are you today? Michelle, I'm doing quite well. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you. Such an exciting time for precious metals. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. We want to start off with a look at the numbers. Silver actually has had a rather lousy time over the past seven years. It fell from close to $49 per ounce at the height of the European debt crisis back in 2011, all the way down to $13.80 just one month ago which is an important bottom because it actually matched that in December of 2015 as well. David, what are the most relevant factors in determining what price buyers and sellers pay for silver? Well, first of all, I want to just clarify a couple of things. One is that you're, you're, you're accurate. Uh, gold bottomed in the December 2015. Silver bottom at the same price as you indicated, Michelle, pretty much double bottomed. I might argue it bottomed slightly higher than the 215 bottom, but that's mostly immaterial. So one of, part of the answer is that gold has to, you know, has remained in an uptrend from that low. And silver has been flat or slightly in an uptrend. But back to the price. Price is determined, determined by supply and demand, and everyone, you know, thinks they know that. And the reason you can have very low silver prices, you've got a very large uh, supply. And then, of course, it's like, well, how could we have a large supply? We're in a deficit from 1990 to 2006. We had a 15-year deficit of 100 million ounces per year. And we did. And we also had a buildup of above-ground inventories from 2006 till present day. But the point is, I'll get right to it now. The supply is created out of thin air. The supply is basically futures contracts that trade on the COMEX that are promissory notes to pay in good delivery silver. The problem is that they can create a supply that's almost infinite relative to the amount of physical silver that exists. So if you base it on supply and demand, you're looking at a basically a false supply that exists versus a real physical supply. But that's what determines the price. And there is an important caveat that very few address, and that is the amount of physical silver must meet the physical demand always and everywhere. And if it does not, that is when you can have a discrepancy between, let's say, the futures price and the physical price. And that has taken place a few times in the last uh, two decades. So you got a huge supply because it's created out of nothing, and that's what keeps the price low. That's incredible to know there's been a discrepancy between the actual physical silver and what people are buying. <laughs> right? It causes a little bit of a 
Eyes, eyebrows going up. Um, speaking of that, David, going back to the CFTC hearings, the work of GATA.org with the confessions of the traders at JP Morgan, Barclays, HSBC, and other leading banks regarding their own market markers manipulation of silver prices. How easy is it to smash or hold down the price in the short term? Well, I made the argument in the past, Michelle, that you cannot uh, manipulate the trend in a long, from a long-term perspective, but in an intermediate term, you can basically take it almost anywhere you want. I'm not even sure if that first statement is true anymore, but coming back to your point, it's pretty easy to manipulate a price, especially in what's called a thin market. So historically, what you'll see is in thin trading, which is from the United States perspective, what we call the aftermarket or the overseas market, where there's not nearly as much activity in the futures uh, pits, that's a metaphor, uh, at night than there is in New York and Chicago during you know, our daylight hours. So what happens is you'll get a huge sell order that hits the market and it has to match. In other words, all futures contracts have to match. So all buyers have to match with sellers. So if it's a $15 price, that wants to buy, there has to be a $15 price that wants to sell. So if you come in and you sell, you know, oh, let's make up a number, um, 10,000 contracts, then the first, let's say, 1,000 might match at a price. We'll call it 15. I'm just doing it for illustration purposes. And there's basically no one out there in what's called the open market, which has an open order that's willing to buy silver at a certain price that exists. And so the market will have what's called a gap down, which means that they have to match. So now it goes down from, let's say, 15 to 14. I'm using this as, a, as an illustration until there's a match there. And there's a match of, let's say, 2,000 contracts with 8,000 left to go. So this is what happens. I mean, it's just absolutely indicative of a price manipulation. I wrote about it in the Silver Manifesto. Uh, Adrian Douglas has probably done some of the best work. Uh, God bless him. He's not, no longer with us. Uh, probably, I wouldn't say I was closest to him in the GATA group, but certainly um, we had uh, an intellectual allegiance. I mean, he and I thought a lot alike and really, I really thought a great deal of him. Anyway, back to the present day. So this stuff continues to go on. I mean, the the CFTC has been taking the task. Well, I shouldn't say that. The CFTC has had many inquiries over the years about the manipulation of the price of silver. And to try to be objective, they never really said there's no manipulation, move on. What they've always said in the past until recently is there's not enough evidence to proceed. But now we have enough evidence to proceed because of this J.P. Morgan trader that admitted guilt. He said, I'm guilty. And not only did he say he's guilty, he said, I learned it from my betters. I learned it from my managers. I learned it from, from my, the bank I'm working for. <laughs> and this is not resolved yet. So we finally have a, an in. And there's been other manipulations that the banks have admitted to, and they pay these small fines, and no one really gets uh, you know, put in jail or anything. But we're at a point now where this investigation is ongoing and we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what they're going to uncover. We really don't know if justice will be served, but it's probably the best we've had so far in this unbelievable market, especially in the silver market, where there's so much paper versus physical reality. It pales any other market, oil, oats, the agriculturers, anything else you want to look at. Yeah, there could be more paper contracts than physical quantity, but it's a pittance relative to how much there is in the silver market. David, what is it about silver that is so important for these banks that they would actually risk doing something illegal just to manipulate the price? That's a great question. And, you know, why it gets to intent? And I really don't know why. I mean, I'll give you my two cents. And, you know, this is where I probably lose some credibility because that's a great <laughs> question. And most, most anybody that thinks more like the establishment say, you know, David sounds pretty level-headed. He sounds pretty logical. But, you know, they can't, they can't care. Do they really care about the price of silver? Are you kidding me, David? Come on. 
So I'll get that out there because I can see that, you know. And really, I don't think the banks care that much about the price of silver. What they care about is the price of gold. But since silver and gold are so highly correlated, that if the silver price took off from, let's say, 20 to 100, and gold sat there, there'd be a lot of people, even from the banks, that would, some from the banks would be asking, what the heck's going on here? How can silver take off and gold can't? So they pretty much have to keep them under wraps in, uh, you know, in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Is when gold goes up, silver goes up, gold goes down. There's a very high correlation between the two. So my premise is they probably don't care as much about silver, although it takes a lot more paper to control it than gold but they care about gold, but they cannot have that, you know, overused phraseology, canary in a gold mine, screaming and shouting, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, and gold sitting in their flats. They pretty much have to take care of both of them. Having said that, I would like to add on one thing, Michelle, and that is that there was at one time what's called the strategic stockpile of silver. And the reason it was strategic is it was for mil military purposes. And as deep as I've looked in the silver market for years, the one thing that no one can really determine with any great accuracy is how much physical silver is used by the military. What we do know is it's a great deal because of, you know, warfare or war uh, manufacturing, you know, like, I mean, little solar panels for communications and satellites and all this stuff. But a lot of the mill spec batteries use silver because of the reliability and the, uh, and the, electronic properties of the metal. So my point is that at one time the U.S. government looked at it as so critical that they had a stockpile of it. And then around uh, 1986, uh, some brilliant senator or someone in the government decided that the stockpile is just collecting dust. We don't really need it. And so they started the Silver Eagle program. Really, it's a Silver Liberty program if you want to go to the actual wording. But and they started to basically sell off the silver uh, by putting the bullion into coins through the treasury and minting out silver eagles, as they're referred to. And, of course, they started, and at the time it was uh, the edict or the, the law was that you had to acquire all silver domestically. So you had the stockpile of silver to produce the coins, and they started running low on that, so they bought silver from domestic mines which the U.S. produces very little silver relative to re the rest of the world. So then that didn't work. So then they had to change the law and say, well, now it's not domestic silver only. We can import silver to keep the Silver Eagle program going. So if the United States was relying upon their own silver sources, we'd be hurting very, very badly. But we aren't because we're allowed to import it, uh, you know, from other countries to meet our needs. You know, that's very interesting. It's a very interesting point. I think when people think about, you know, getting those silver eagles, they don't realize that our government is actually selling off our stockpile as a country of our reserve silver. Yeah, well, that left a long time ago, Michelle. And as I said a moment ago, we were just importing it from other places to, to produce the, the coins now. We sold it all. <laughs> wow. You know, David, our company has written extensively about the correlation between energy prices, specifically oil, and the price of spot silver. There's a very clear relationship here. Have you covered this angle over the years? Not as well as I should have, and I'll tip my hat to my friend, uh, Steve St. Angelo, SRS Rocco. He does great work. Yes, you uh, if my business is doing better, I'd make him an offer to work for me, at least part-time. But no, Steve's done a really good job. In fact, really, to be totally honest, Steve probably pointed it out to me. I, you know, kind of vaguely, it's one aspect of silver, and I'm always learning more, never claim to know everything, that I really haven't looked at very carefully. And he pointed it out I've, since that point in time, years ago, I've looked at it. And what's very interesting, as you know, Michelle, oil prices have sold off sharply here recently. And I think they're going to rebound from here. I could be wrong, but they're pretty low right now. And silver starting off is finally starting to catch a bid and starting to move up off of this low that you just mentioned. So it'd be very interesting to me to see um, if, you know, this fall off in oil and silver, uh, and they both start marching uh, upward from here or not. But I, and they're not, they're very correlated, but, you know, People don't understand correlations, meaning that it isn't one-for-one one and day-by-day and week-by-week, 
But generally, when oil's moving up, silver's moving up. So I think you're right. I think that oil is probably going higher, even though many of my peers think it's not. In fact, some think it's going to 30. And I don't know. What I do know is how to watch the market carefully and correct and continue. If the market tells me something that I disagree with, I'm very smart, I'm smart enough to know I won't argue with the market and make a correction. And I've done that most of my life. And that's what makes uh, some analysts better than others is the ability to admit you're wrong and make a move uh, contrary to what you might have thought because the market's teaching you something different. And that's basically the only way to really invest or speculate uh, successfully. Speaking of investing, what is your general strategy for finding the best mining stocks to position in? It's pretty simple, actually, because unlike, let's say, the beverage industry or the fashion industry or textiles or whatever, because you have different brands and different tastes. I mean, gold is gold. <laughs> if gold is, you know, it's fungible. Every, every ounce of gold is like every other ounce. It doesn't matter who stamped the coin, if it came out of Canada or South Africa or United States, it's gold. So that makes, gives you a little bit of advantage as far as how to analyze which company is the best. And when you do that analytical work, what you'll find is that the streaming companies have a superior advantage over any other type of company that's in the gold mining industry. Basically, these are finance companies. And these have been extremely successful for anyone that has subscribed to the Morgan Report over the years. My basic premise at the beginning of about 20 years ago, a little longer than that, was that in the long-term bull market, you could buy some of these royalty and streaming companies and just buy them once and hold them through the entire bull market. And that's still true, but there's so much volatility in the, in the metals, as you well know. You really are best served by trading um, part of the portfolio, which is what I do at the Morgan Report. They get to look over my shoulder, and when things get overheated, let's take some profits here. And over the years, a lot of the paper profits I've taken out of the gold and silver equities I've placed into physical metal. So it's sort of a nice way. You got to leverage both directions. You got to leverage on the way up. So you usually get a three to one. So if gold's up 20%, a good gold stock's up 60%. But it works in reverse. If gold's off 10%, a gold stock could be off 30%. That's just a general rule of thumb. It varies somewhat, but that's the general idea. <clears throat> that's an interesting equation, though. Good to watch. Good to know it's there. Now, David, Ray Dalio is a billionaire hedge fund manager and one of the most educated debt experts in the world. And he's clearly saying that a bear market for the dollar is beginning due to unfunded liabilities and the lack of will of foreigners to continue to fund Washington as China is presenting itself as a rising power worth connecting with diplomatically. It's really no surprise that trillion dollar annual deficits are not easy to swallow. If this scenario plays itself out, commodities could really take off and have the wind at their back. Could you please break down to us what the correlation is between dollar bear markets and commodity bull markets? Well, in a highly stressed situation where the whole system is based upon trust or confidence, and that's the system that we're in. When that starts to break down, then obviously people go from things that are um, less tangible, like a stock certificate, to something that's very tangible, like a commodity. So if there is fear in the marketplace and loss of confidence, then there's a move into uh, from usually the equity market into the commodity sector. And that's just the general trend that has taken place uh, over and over again as these things cycle back and forth. The problem is that if you're in a stagflation, which I believe we're entering, you will have an inc a decrease in physical economic viability. In other words, you're producing less and it's less efficient because the overall global economy is starting to slow down, but an increase in prices. So I'm fairly bearish on some of the commodity sectors outside of the top tier of the metals, which is the money metals, and the foodstuffs. Uh, financials, we don't have time to go into. I'm pretty negative the stock market, fairly negative the bond market. 
Uh, I've never argued with Mr. Dalio. We're in different leagues. I think the dollar is not going to do that poorly. I'm neutral on the dollar for most of this year. Again, I'll repeat, based if the market shows me something different and says I'm wrong, I will say I'm wrong and I'm changing it. <laughs> the market just taught me something I didn't see, you know, two weeks ago, two minutes ago, whatever it is. But um, so I think we probably have, I'm going to guess because no one knows, six months or so of the dollar kind of wallowing in this area in the 90s, so to speak, on the dollar index. But uh, further on, you know, it's, it's the end of the age of something for nothing. You know, the idea that you can print up wealth has failed every time it's been tried. It's never been tried to this extent where a nation state with a great military backing could go in and basically command or dictate to the world what the value of something is at the uh, point of a gun and uh, basically make everybody adhere to that. And this is the point where we've reached, which is the end of the age of empire, and we're getting to the close of that. We're basically at a dollar from 1913 that's worth two or three cents. And so what we're really arguing about is how fast we're going to lose that two or three pennies. Is it going to be, you know, in the next two or three years, or is it going to be in the next 30 years? I think it's more likely to be in the next few years than the next few decades uh, for many, many reasons. So I would certainly agree with Ray longer term. On my shorter term look, I think maybe it's got not strength, but neutrality. I don't think. But the one thing the dollar has that not too many talk about is we've got positive yields and we're increasing our interest rates, which means it's more attractive to the suckers out there that are stupid enough to buy it. Excuse me, I do get on Iran occasionally. But it is a fiat currency, but it's the best one out there relative to these ones that are providing a negative yield. So I think the dollar game has still got a ways to go, um, but not that long to go. In other words, I don't see the U.S. dollar in its present form existing in three decades. I don't see it existing in a decade. I actually have stuck my neck out again, which I'm good at doing, and my head's still attached to my body, but uh, <laughs> I have scars back here a few times. <laughs> right. But... Um, I don't think we've really got five more years of the president's stance. And I want to add one other thing about, and I've been thinking about this a lot, about Catherine Austin Fitz's work with uh, Professor Skidmore and, and showing without, beyond a shadow of a doubt that we don't have a $22 trillion deficit. We really have about a $43 trillion deficit. So if you look at the interest payment at, at the current interest rates on the treasury, treasury bills, the interest is about a $500 million bill right now on the official number, which is $22 trillion in debt. But if you took the true number and double it, that's about a trillion dollar a year just interest payment. And these are absurd levels. These cannot be maintained. Something's got to give. So when you say something's got to give, uh, lay that out for us. What scenario do you predict um, it's about yeah, to happen? It's extremely difficult. I mean, it's, it's easy to tell you from monetary history what happens is a loss of confidence. But how, when, where, why that happens is impossible really to predict. I mean, I've used the scenarios and I've thought of several. Many of my peers have probably thought it through as, you know, as well as I have or better. Mm -hmm. But basically, at some point in time, I look at the scenario as kind of a mistake. You know, this fat thumb trader that some of your listeners may be familiar with. But basically, what I could foresee as an example is that somebody in the bond market starts to off the United States, their treasury holdings, at a greater clip and a greater quantity than they normally do. And it's only because they want to move into the euro or whatever the reason being. It doesn't really matter. It's just that someone that's on the other side sees that Japan's dumping U.S. treasuries like crazy. They haven't dumped this many for so long. What do they know that I don't know? And they don't know anything. They're just doing something that they decided that day they wanted to boost their currency reserves in this other currency. But that trader sees the other trader and he gets scared and says, you know what? I don't know what his intel is, but he knows something I don't. I'm getting out of the treasuries. So once that kind of thinking takes hold, all of a sudden you could have a big sell-off in the United States debt markets that's caused a kind of a waterfall decline. Now, there's all kinds of uh, circuit breakers in place and the working group of financial markets, and they have the ability to close the markets down and make them pause and catch their breath, and all this type of thing takes place, and it's already has occurred. 
but um, that doesn't negate uh, what Bill Holter calls the uh, the mother nature of monetary systems. In other words, uh, nature is greater than uh, than man. And so once this confidence is lost, when the markets reopen, you could see it continue to decline or there's much intervention that takes place. But at some point, the intervention may not work. In other words, like the QE phenomenon that took place uh, after the financial crisis of 2008, it worked kind of. It certainly quelled the markets and caught most people into the slumber that everything's going to be okay when it really hasn't been fixed. And so we're at a point where if it happened again, maybe there'd be enough bright people to understand that this fix isn't working. And so the markets uh, reopen and they start to uh, pour in uh, more funny money to make it better. Uh, the market rejects that because they know it's really a miserable failure. And that's what we're up against. Uh, I do know that the authorities know all the stuff that I'm talking about. They're probably never going to say it as directly as I am. But, you know, if you listen to the IMF and, and read between the lines and even some of the, the Fed speak that you listen to, if you read between the lines, these people are pretty aware of it. What, I, what I'm not aware of is exactly what they plan uh, to take over. You know, are they going to go to the SDR? Are they going to have some type of cryptocurrency that's nationally backed? Or are they going to infiltrate the cryptocurrencies that exist? Uh, are they going to eliminate cash and uh, re-close the banks and give everybody a new type of uh, you know, currency? I don't know. What I do know is that we don't have a lot longer in my studied view on the path that we're on. That's so um, interesting and frightening to know that because I think everyone envisions the fact that it's a controlled situation, that when this starts to fall, it's going to be on purpose, that there's going to be some sort of plan in place. But what you bring up is the fact that it could be something very innocent, some sort of mistake somebody does, doesn't even mean to do it, that starts the ball rolling. But hopefully... Um, everything will be, they know enough to know to have the plan in place because they know that too, right? <laughs> they know this could be an innocent mistake to start this off. Well, Michelle, you make an extremely important point and I'd like to drill down on it a little bit. So as you stated, and I'll reiterate, uh, most people think there's a plan in place and in a down market, the market's controlled. Uh, there is a movie, in fact, it's on my bookshelf back here called Trillion Dollar Bet. And that's a documentary of what happened to long-term capital management. And the premise is that, my premise is that human nature cannot be forecast. Now, if you look at long-term capital management, human behavior can be forecast. And I'll agree, human behavior can be forecast perhaps 90% of the time, or maybe even 99% of the time. But it cannot be predicted 100% of the time. So when long-term capital managers making a bet on the Russian ruble, their math gave them a certain uh, equation that they would be able to cover their situation with the Russian ruble. And they were wrong because you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time. And that's a problem with what you said, which you're very much correct. Most people believe that, you know, we're powerful. We have the, you know, the levers of the controls of the banking system. We can liquid, you know, we can stop the markets. We can restart them. We can add liquidity. We can make loans. We can do all this stuff. We're in control. But long-term capital management proved that you cannot be in control all the time. And that's, a, I just want to make that very crystal clear because in my lifetime, and I've been looking at this stuff for a very long time, there's been a few instances where I've said to myself, aha, that's it. I remember when Barings Bank went down in the UK. And I mean, I forget how many, that was a 200 year bank or something. That was a very big stalwart bank. And I thought that's it because I kind of equated to this credit stalt bank in Austria going down at the start of, uh, of the great depression. But coming back on point, long-term capital management, I thought that's it, you know? And then the 2008 crisis, I mean, that was as close in my lifetime as it ever got to being it. I mean, as far as I'm personally concerned, I'm very studied on this topic. We were, I don't know, we're within hours of failing, but we're probably within days of failing. And 
right or wrong, the Fed took action immediately and quelled the markets by buying up absolute worthless crap called securitized debt, which is basically mortgage-backed securities that were frauds and substituted treasury bills for them or treasury notes or treasury bonds. In other words, the full faith and credit of the U.S. taxpayer to make good on the debt mistakes that had made, been made by the mortgage industry. And we got through that, but um, probably over talking the topic, but I'm passionate about it. I want as many people to wake up as possible. I also want them to know that we've had financial panics in the past. People survive them. We get through them. My main concern is when we come out the other side, we come out with a better system. And that's my main worry. Um, right now, I'd have to look you in the eye and say, I am pretty doubtful that will come out with a better system. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm favorable to competing currencies. I'm favorable to the blockchain. I'm not that hip on the uh, cryptocurrency model, but I'm not against it. I'm for free markets. And, you know, an alternative currency, like gold and silver and cryptos is certainly a start. But as I've quoted Michael Rupert in the past, unless we change the way money works, we really haven't changed anything. So we could go through a quote unquote collapse come back, the bank are still in charge and nothing really has changed other than they've reset and we're still under their, uh, their purview, their, uh, their control. And that's what we don't want. We want to be able to control our own destiny. We don't want to be controlled by the banking elite anymore. We've had enough of it. Right. David, it has been such an honor to have you on this show. Please tell our audience a little bit about your own background and what it is you do and how to follow your work. Oh, my background, I could be long-winded. I mean, I was fascinated <laughs> by money at a very early age, and I was passionate about this industry. Um, so I worked in different areas of the industry, but... Uh, my work basically found at themorganreport.com. Just go there and get on our free email list. I do a weekly perspective every weekend that gives you kind of a full look at the uh, financial markets. I try to keep it around 10 minutes. I try to always conclude with a comment about gold or silver or both. Uh, we do do some offers on that mailing list from time to time. Some people love them. Some people hate them. If you don't like them, just you know, take a pass. But I suggest you stay on the free email list because you do get update information like this uh, every week. Uh, by staying on the free list. And then I do have a YouTube. I do have a Twitter. Um, I have a basic Facebook. I don't even know how to do it. My secretary does it for me. Uh, but mostly YouTube and Twitter are the main places to find me, especially Twitter. If you want to follow my thinking on economic news, I will find things during the day. And usually I post. I have, I've given access to two of my uh, Two of my analysts that work with me, they can also post on my Twitter feed. But most of the time, it's me. It's something that I've found that I think is worthwhile. So enough about me and Twitter. But go to themorganreport.com. Give me a first name and email address. Validate you're not a robot. You've got the free email list. If you're so inclined after reading that for a while, you're certainly welcome to join the uh, subscription service, which is the Morgan Report Premium Service, or the Advanced Service, which is the Mastermind Service. Perfect. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Mr. David Morgan, the creator of the TheMorganReport.com. For the Precious Metals New Bull Run series of shows, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. A huge interview with John Rubino of Dollar Collapse, a Gerald Salente explosive interview which got incredible feedback. Carl Denninger with new data that is essential for investors have all been published on the channel. Make sure you get the boil down on David Morgan with a must read PDF on his greatest career moments. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Morgan.